Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. Savvy Painter is the podcast for painters who know that mastering your craft is a lifelong venture. They understand that the hardest part is showing up every day, whether they're inspired or not, and that we're all in this together. For the past three years, the Savvy Painter podcast has been sharing tips and techniques that you can use every day in your studio. And when you join the Savvy Painter email list now, you get a collection of inspiring quotes and practical advice collected from years of Savvy Painter interviews. Just go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe to sign up for weekly emails and get your free PDF essential tips for artists. Each week, I interview established artists like Anne Gale, Scott Connery, Rebecca Crowell, and many other artists who are willing to open their studio doors, share their painting processes, and talk candidly about what it takes to consistently grow your skills. We get into the nitty-gritty of their daily studio practice, what tricks they play on themselves to avoid getting caught up in perfectionism, how to use flashcards as reminders to stay on track during long painting sessions, and other cool tactics to quiet the inner critic and continue moving towards excellence. The Savvy Painter podcast is filled with artists who generously share their stories, and by sharing their stories, they show the rest of us that we are not alone. So join us with the Savvy Painter email list and get even more connected with weekly emails. Sign up now and you get essential tips for artists, the inspiring quotes and practical advice collected from years of Savvy Painter interviews. Go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. It's that easy. This week, I am proud to present to you an interview with renowned artist Bert Silverman. Bert is a classic realist painter. He's been painting and exhibiting for over 60 years. This is part one of a two-part episode, and in this piece, Bert talks about some of the things that make a good painting. Somehow or other, and it's not prescribed by any particular style, we have to reach some level of discovery when we paint. Something about the world that is unique to our perception and our sensibility, and that connects somehow with other people in a way that is surprising or enveloping in a way that the word that often comes to mind is, oh, that's beautiful. We also talk about when skill becomes too much of a good thing and the artist's voice, how critical that is to making a good painting. At almost 90 years old, Bert has experienced and been witness to major shifts in the U.S. culture, and he talks about how that impacts his painting. We discuss how women are portrayed in the arts and race relations. And I want to note that this conversation took place just a few days before the events in Charlottesville, Virginia. When I asked Bert if from his vantage point he thought things were getting any better, we had no idea what was about to erupt here in the United States. Here is part one with Bert Silverman. Well, Bert, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. It is an honor and a pleasure to have you on this show. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to take part in this kind of discussion. And uh, with the people you've already involved, I think it, it can be a kind of interesting catalog of feeling and sensibility about 21st century art. As a kid in the 1930s, Burt became interested in art when he was exposed to N.C. Wyeth, the famous American illustrator and father of Andrew Wyeth. Seeing N.C. Wyeth's work sparked Burt's imagination. Walking through the neighborhoods of Brooklyn became a different experience. He saw color and dynamic shadows instead of drab brown stones. And at 13 years old, his cousin gave him a book on early Flemish art, and that book provoked a dramatic shift in what he saw as possible in painting. After seeing his interest and devotion to the arts, his parents enrolled him at the Fiorella LaGuardia High School of Music and the Arts. When I went to a high school, the Specialized High School of Music and Art in Manhattan, and it was set up by a very forward-looking mayor, Fiorella LaGuardia, and the school was named the Fiorella LaGuardia School of Music and Art. It produced an enormous number of very talented people. and. Interestingly, it was staffed in the early years, and this is 1941 and 42 when I got it, by people from the then City College, which is now part of City University, <laughs> who, who were fired 
from their jobs because they were considered to be radicals or reds or leftists or so on. This was uh, a very interesting time in American life. What year was this? That would have been in the 50s, right? 1942, 43. Yes, okay. it was very early on. No, we have a wonderful history of getting worried about communism. <laughs> And here I thought it just all it all started in the fifties, and it was it was much earlier. Uh, we can go back to the twenties, and the fact with the something called the Palmer raids, which is a, the Attorney General who was named Palmer, who threw a lot of people out of the country. In fact, my father was a, a member of the New York Socialist Party. I didn't know about this, and learned about it much later. So it's a genetic thing. Don't worry about it. <laughs> The Socialist Party was expelled from the New York State Legislature. I don't know how it was done legally, but it it got him worried because he was then a young man with a growing family and was worried about what would happen to his career. He was an accountant, whether it would affect his professional life or whatever. But that being said, I learned that that kind of Interesting anxiety. Eugene Debs, great socialist, and an anti-war protester. Old Wilson's War, not the new Wilson, but the old Wilson. There's somebody that called Wilson's War as a senator who fought the, the Russians in Afghanistan. Yes, and they made a movie about that, right, with Tom Hanks. Yep. Unfortunately, that's how I know that. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. But our history is hidden from us, and our history of modern art also is hidden from us. But co-joined with that, I grew up with this sense of, of the understanding about what art could be, even though we had no paintings in our home, except a very bad painting of a sailboat, which I remember because I, I copied it. And it was terrible, but that was the art we had. And then, long about them. 1938 or 39, my parents got culture and they bought a, a book of reproductions of Van Gogh. Mm. It didn't interest me as much at that point in time. And then something else happened. The New York World's Fair gathered together three centuries of the great art of the past. Wow. And I went to the World's Fair thinking I was going to get all those gimmicks and toys and see wonderful things in the future. And inadvertently, I wandered in one of the pavilions. And I never left. Every time our family went to the World's Fair, I said, I'm just going to stay here. You can find me. And I I almost choke up when I think about how infused I was with a sense of possibility that the world could be so remarkably transcribed made into pictures, huge paintings, you know, not, with no screw around with little stuff. Mm. And it was probably the beginning of my sense that that was what I wanted to do. Wow. How did your parents respond to that? They were very unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> they were parents of the Depression. Mm-hmm. And for them, the idea of the stability of making a living was paramount in their thinking. The dilemma was a very clear one. I had a lot of very early skills, which brought a lot of admiration. My father particularly loved to show them over. Mm. And and at the same time, it was a career issue. Where is this kid going to go? You know, he's very nice. And he, he brings home drawings from art school that all the kids in, on the block want to see because they're noobs. <laughs> Hey, can I see one of those? I can still remember it. You know? I mean, this is Brooklyn, 1930, 1942. Yeah, right, right. It was, nevertheless, the encounter at this school was remarkable. I met a group of guys, two of whom, survivors, still friends. One of them is a painter named Harvey Dinnerstein. I don't know if you know his name. And I, I've known him for 75 years. Wow. He's the longest living acquaintance I have on earth. And the interaction was remarkable because all of these young artists were talented beyond belief. 
And we formed a kind of matrix, both of competition and of learning. One of the fellows was a kind of more worldly artist. He would go to art galleries and schlep us all to go with him. We went to museums. We'd never done that as something on our own. So I'm curious, we were talking earlier about you were the juror for a show. And just the idea of during a show caused you, it sounded like, to write down what what is it that makes a a piece of art good? I could summarize it. I was going to I was going to read a quote from it, but that might be tedious. But in summary, what it comes down to is that I value the idea of of draftsmanship, of the ability to record the world in an accurate way. But at the same time, as has happened now, currently, I'm very concerned about the camera sensibility. I think the camera gives you a monocular view of the world. Uh And it doesn't allow for something that is important, which is a time-saturated representation of the world. And in that time span, as you go from point to point to point, as the painting progresses, different things happen psychologically and visually. And all of those become components that are accretions of both observation and sensibility and feeling. They constantly modify your first impulse. They just the idea of changing something because it's not right. That not right is not just the accuracy of representation, but something about the image that doesn't quite say what you thought it ought to have said at the beginning. And all of that becomes a measure of something else, which is how does that evocation of the real world begin to shape an idea? a concept that you may not even have been aware of when you were drawn to that particular subject matter. And I think that is the curiosity. And that's, for example, you could look at a body of work by, say, that aforementioned Andrew Wyatt and see that there was a strain in what he felt and what he experienced that manifested itself in various different kinds of images, whether it was an outdoor or an indoor figure or not, but was nevertheless the part of something that was discernible, that evoked that sense of space and time and his feeling about the landscape. It wasn't just that he recorded it beautifully, effectively, accurately, Mm. but something else that was saturated with a kind of almost unexplainable feeling. I don't want to get into, you know, areas of mystique here, but it's true. We could all say, oh, no, I identify with that. The authenticity of it, the harshness of the landscape, the loneliness, the farm life, the lack of color. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, wasn't an accident. Of course, he was berated for it constantly, for being unable to view the world <laughs> and painting with any color sense. But you see, that was the point. So that one's deficits as a person or one's peculiar psychological kind of construct, how we're put together, well, our genetics are all jambled up. We're not we're not the same. We're subject to different kinds of stimuli. That's that brings up a really interesting topic because it's you know when you are painting from observation or when you're you're painting either from observation or from memory not just copying something but putting more of yourself into the painting that to me is what makes art original because then then you have some then you have something of the artist in in the painting like you're talking about and i get these questions so often from artists who listen to the podcast about how do artists find you know that, that basically what they're saying is you know i've been studying art i've been you know whether it's in a academic 
tradition or on their own, regardless of how they're doing it. They've struggled with technique and they've, they've gotten some facility with technique, but what they're, what they can't seem to get is their voice. You know, what they can't seem to get is, you know, how do I, how do I find my voice is the actual question that I get. And so I'm curious, what, what are your thoughts on that? The interesting thing is you, you've touched on a, a very critical issue. A lot of, just give me a quick background, a lot of the art criticism, and certainly with modernist art, has been all about stuff, about the means of art, and not the content or what I call the content, the ends. Why are you doing, why are you making the schmears? And so how do you identify that self, that voice, if you're committed to a a certain kind of a way of putting the paint on. Why is it important for you to get the accuracy of light and form and resemblance? And does it constrict? Does it keep you locked in? Does it keep you from that other element, which is often identified with style? And you think about it, we talk about the impressionists. It's not about what they painted but how they painted it. Mm. Or the post-Impressionists. It's not about what those guys did. They just transformed Impressionism into a mildly kind of schematic form, which we call more abstract. What happened after that? We got Cubism. Was Cubism about cubes? No, it was a way of identifying what it looked like, what the style was, what the way the forms were made but not what that meaningfulness, that terrible word, meaningfulness came out of it. Picasso said at one point, and it was a quote I read, he said, this painting has nothing to do with the world. It's got nothing to do with cups and saucers. And that's the key to modernism. And I liken it to the way my grandchildren make pictures. They look down and they make stuff on them. Some of them are quite interesting, as a matter of fact. And I had a, a painting that I didn't need to fool somebody with. I was showing a whole array of modernist work. And the photo came up on the screen and said, oh, who's that? I don't recognize that. And I said, I know that's my four-year-old grandson named Rocky. And he's going to be a great painter someday. The reason I mention it is not kids can do as well as those famous artists is that those artists have functioned the same way my kids do. They look down and out of their gut comes feeling mm. amorphous, unregulated, undifferentiated, inaccessible to me because feeling is a generic kind of characteristic. There are all kinds of feelings, feelings of hate, wonder, exaggeration, a whole array of what tension. But tell me, what what is that? Wonderful black painting that always inspired admiration for me when I was young because it was so simple and it was so evocative. Franz Klein, wonderful. And I say that is a problematic issue in all. How do you art, not from the vantage point of means, of stuff, of how it's done, of what it looks like, but how effective is it in transforming your experience. Mm. See, everybody, Sargent was rediscovered. I spent a lot of years feeling Sargent was a rather superficial artist. I changed my mind. Why did you? I've heard both sides of that. Why? What made you change your mind? Because you see, his stuff was disguised by all this wonderful elegance of fabric, material, things that were flashily painted and so on. And it struck me when I, I had seen it was at the Cork Museum, which is now defunct in Washington. Had a lot of sergeants. And he had a painting of a woman standing outside, and behind her was some wonderful, elegant house. And the, I suddenly realized, everybody forgets to look at her face. There's an enormous amount of character coming out of that. There's a whole sense of some woman of noblesse oblige, who couldn't give a crap about her being painted. <laughs> there was an intimate understanding of who he was painting. And all of her, his heads are not painted 
a la prima slapdash, which was just a, a kind of delightful characterization to put to it so it's easy to see and put, you know, you have too many artists in the world. Forget about it. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I just came across another registry of art. Some, some woman who loves a lot of very high level, highly developed, almost hyper real art, went through posting all of the successive artists. And I kept flipping through. There must have been a hundred people with unreal technical skills. Never before had they existed. I mean, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, even when I was in the middle of what I thought was my career, there were only a handful of people who were that developed in terms of their skills. And here they are, and all of the all of these people were names never heard of. Do you think that's because there are more people painting now, or do you think that's because we have access to it through sites like Pinterest, where you can see it? Whereas, you know, in other another situation, maybe you never would have seen him. It's very hard to know. Mm. It really is. I think it's the ebb and flow of of culture and of even genetic development. For so many years, people were discouraged from thinking about painting realistically. Of course, the whole measure of fame and fortune was linked to non-object painting and to the, to the latest thing. In that sense, there was, look, if you have a, a facility and you don't use it, it doesn't seem to be there, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, I would say back in the 80s, I, was, uh, I had a gallery in Washington, Bethesda. The guy was an insane opponent of modernism. And he began to find people who were doing things that were totally averse of what was the dominant art. And he suddenly, he was like a, a discoverer. And then there's another gallery in New York who suddenly picked it up. And little by little, these like sprouts of people who were out there doing things that no one thought was possible or would happen. There were a lot of cityscapes that developed. All of that, I mean, there were dozens of people now who are doing remarkable replications of city landscapes, something that people could never possibly do. Is it computer-rated? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Frankly, when I see it, I get very tired. <laughs> because... <laughs> It looks like hard work. I'd never thought of art as hard work in that sense of the physical kind of rendering. But the hard work was in getting it to really work as a painting, to really make it work as a piece of art. And by the way, I don't want to lose the thread of something that we touched on about that difficulty of what I call re discovering the totality of art, both the means and the ends, both the form and the content that is like a DNA thread is intricately wound up with one another. And you can, you can look at a Rembrandt and describe all the things about it, but what you can't describe is the fact that those paintings still stay with you. Mm -hmm. And still impact on you. They mm. done 400 years ago. And they still talk about his life and his world. Look, you know, I'm picking on the, the very most famous, but it's easy to talk about when you think about that particular painting. Why does it survive? Why does it? Is it just because it's in the museum? Let me tell you, having work in a museum helps. <laughs> it really changes perception. I had a retrospect of, well, the first one I had back in, in 2001 at a couple of museums. It traveled from, it was not the New Britain Museum, uh, but it went to, to the at Brigham Young Museum of Art. It was a new museum, not well known, but a magnificent. The Mormons really know how to do things very nicely. And I had 50 paintings in it, and it was a book published as a result of the book is still on Amazon for, you know, resale again and again. And I had seen my work in the studio and I had all the reservations about, mm, 
That's okay. That's not bad. And then I suddenly saw it in the museum when I walked around and I said, shit, I'm pretty good. <laughs> But there is something it's like it's like you have these, you know, like when I feel like when paintings are, are in the studio and they're leaning up against the wall and they're in their shelves and, you know, what have you. And they're they're just all in there. They're like these scruffy little children. And then when you when you take them out and you put them in a, in a gallery or in a museum, it's like they're all cleaned up and ready to go to a party. And they they look very different. It's when transformed. They, yes, it's an absolute transformation. So I just can imagine that feeling you had when you walked in and you saw your your fifty your fifty works of art in in an environment that presents them. And, and it was also, remo- I mean, it was fascinating because the way it was hung, it was not hung the way a lot of contemporary paintings are done. You know, one on top of another. Or I had like six or eight feet of space between each painting. So every one of them became its own thing, its own event. And uh, someone who was at the opening came up to me and said, you're a glorious painter. And uh, and she pointed to one particular painting. She said, how did you get that leg to work? (laughs) That was the last thing I was thinking about. I thanked her in any way, but it didn't matter. It was like, does change perception. I, it happened even before that. A very wonderful artist who has a great reputation as a caricaturist, the monumental one, David Levine. Mm, mm-hmm. And in fact, regretfully, and I think to his detriment, he was a wonderful painter, painter, he did not just a you know graphic artist. And he used to do these marvelous little watercolors that were inventive, that had all of the play of material and so on, and yet still hung on to a real person or real situation. And I used to see his work in the studio and say, and oh, that's great, I love it, and so on. Next thing I saw it in a gallery, and suddenly they were changed. You see, remarkable. How yeah. you think that whole thing was transformative in it. And setting does become important for that reason. Setting and presentation is very important. Yes, yes, and we and I think it's easy to forget that when we're lost in the work. And it's also another thing too that I guess every artist understands is that since making a painting is so problem related, you're always solving what's wrong with it, and then you look at it five years later and you see what was right with it. You know what was good, what came out of it that you weren't sensitive to in the, in the very practical, structural way. Mm. So, you know, perception is a funny thing. But nonetheless, the criteria that I think is important is still very hard to see in so many cases because we're seduced by craftsmanship, by elaborate kind of things that I see now that are remarkable in terms of their ability to not photographically, but to simulate what I call mimesis, which is a way of saying fancy word, right? It's making something which substitutes for the real thing. Mm. Mimesis is, is on steroids. It has become so extravagant that the bewilderment and the aesthetic delight in seeing it takes something away. I ask, okay, what is that about? more than that wonderful recreation of the real world, of what we think is the real world. Yeah, there's that vitality and authenticity that comes through, I think. And and it sounds like that's what you noticed in the Sargent painting, that, you know, within a single work of art, it sounds to me like what you were observing was that flash of his facility painting the gown and painting, you know, that kind of bravada And then in the face, there was what he really cared about and what then the artist came through and was able to show the sitter in a way that really that was powerful to you. Sargent's problem (laughs) is too much of a good thing. He painted close to 1500 portraits. And as a portrait painter myself, I don't get a lot of work. 
partly because of the screwy things I see. I mean, it's not good for for the subject to be exposed to that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, I pick up stuff that somehow or other the the painted subject doesn't necessarily want to see. Mm. Not just physical characteristics, but something else. Now, I don't want to get spooky about it, but that's the point is, after a while, your inventiveness plays out and you get fatigued. He said at one point, I paint no more mugs, you know, which was his disparagement of, of what was the constant flow of important people or snotty people or people who he didn't care about. There was a show at the Met about three years ago. It was a painting of his friends. Now, interestingly, they weren't characteristically different in style from his more conventional, conventional work, of his commission work. But there was something else in it that was more an homage to his sense of being a, a human being in con- with other people he knew, friends, lovers, whatever. Mm. So those are, those are things that are hard to get rid of unless you you are so so taken with a particular kind of goal i think that for example if you were to look at a lot of paintings now done by youngish artists so guys or women in their 30s 40s so on you see an awful lot of paintings of very very attractive people sometimes young women standing in a field or gazing out or gazing at something. And I have to say to myself, that's not a lot about what women are like, not only not about their life, but how they function in the real world. What's their role? Thank you, Bert. I'm so glad you noticed that because I'm just to be totally honest, I'm getting so sick of those paintings of a girl taking her shirt off in a field. Where does this come from? And go further than that. All the paintings. I have never seen so many paintings of bare rear ends in my whole life. And I wonder about it. I wonder about the anal fascination that's going on, whether it's male-oriented <laughs> or female-oriented. I mean, and not only that, but it does, it, it's dispiriting for me because it, it demeans what realism can be. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's realism because it's not, it's well painted. There's there it technically it's it's well done, but there's no imagination in it. It's to me, it's a product. It's a pretty picture that they I don't know if it's that they think they will sell or that it's titillating to them or that it's, you know, like I don't I don't really get it, but you see the same thing over and over and over again. And it's I just keep waiting for them to get bored of it and do something else because they have skills. Well, it prompted me to start painting in another arena where, look, I'm attracted to a female body. I think that it's a gene thing. I can't, that's what a male, female. And I grew up, I grew up studying from the nude when I was at the Art Students League in New York and I, I would go to evening classes. I mean, I would draw from the nude because that's what you did. That's how you learn at the figure. I teach now. I've been teaching for 45 years, and I almost never, in fact, I never have a nude pose. I talk about, listen, the next time you see somebody nude walking down the street, let me know, because that's what, not what life is generally like. I see nudes in a very special place, in a strip joint, okay? And I say, okay, what's the transformative possibilities of that? of painting women in a role that's been ongoing for hundreds of thousands of years. And I say, what's the aesthetic possibility of that? And what is the emotional content that I can find in that? And what is the, what is the emotional content that you see in that? Well, I thought I saw it. Let me give you an anecdote. I had a young woman who was posing for for art schools, you know, she's life classes. And she had a wonderful kind of depressed quality about it, which I thought was fascinating. And I decided to have a pose in a G-string and stockings for a penny that I was going to do. And something interesting happened. She, turns out she'd also done stripping. 
And I hadn't known that. I thought she was just a school mom. Uh, and <laughs> I asked her, well, you know, what was that like? And she stopped for a moment. She said, I cried myself asleep a lot of the time. Wow. So was it that particular person? I keep thinking all the, brav- the bravado that I've both seen with strippers and has a wonderful life and this crazy kind of underworld that you often see on online. And I thought it was a mask. It was a mask. Mm. Every time I've encountered someone who was posing nude in an art class, I did a drawing. In fact, it was Jay Collins Studios when he had it in Brooklyn. I went to see what it was all about. And there was a a woman posing, and I stopped and made a drawing of her. And there was inevitably that sense of something else, something deadly going on in her face. And I think that's what happens when people feel that they are being used by their look alone, by their body, by their shape, by their smile, whatever it is. And so I was able to do... I think, interesting, I always looked at it and I thought, geez, they're not really very sexy, these paintings that I think, you know, the ones that I look at that are remarkably painted flesh-wise and everything else that have erotic components. And I'm doing a painting of people who are in an erotic confession and they don't look sexy. What's going on? Mm-hmm. Because I don't feel that anymore. I've extracted something else out of it. Well, you're seeing them as as people, not as objects. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's the di- that's the difference in those paintings that we were talking about is it's a trying to be classy objectification, but it's still to me, it's still objectification to me. It's just it's like soft porn. You don't know who that woman is. There's nothing re- there's nothing that, you know, women are sexy, women are strong, women are, are lots of things. But when you just take that one thing and you subtract everything else, you leave a shell and it's not that interesting. I did a painting. I, I didn't send it to you. I should have years ago, about 10 years ago, right after 9-11, when there was such a rage against the enemy and, and all of the things that were happening. And out of it, I thought something else was going to happen that was unexpected which was that there was going to be another upsurge of protest because what I saw happening was turning back to another time, a time in which the enemy was so paramount, the Russians and communism and so on. It was terrorism now taking its place. And I felt something would come out of it that was unexpected and that would be prevalent. So I... I constructed a painting that had all kinds of problems. In it. It's a big painting. But the forefront is three figures. One of them is a young woman with a bandana around her head. That was a throwback to the 60s. Because the painting to me was, in fact, would begin to tap into that kind of sensibility, that kind of protest. But she's a primary figure surrounded by black men and a young white male. And I thought that would be the components of it, because something about our world had forgotten that racism didn't go away. It just got papered over. It's a very hard thing to get rid of, by the way, racism. Mm, mm-hmm. There's a there was a wonderful book called The Painted Bird about an experiment that it was based on an experiment that a, a flock of birds where one bird out of the flock was captured and spray painted various other colors and then set loose with the red flock. And they immediately attacked it and killed it. Wow. That was the experiment. Then there was a book written that was based on that idea about a young boy in Germany who was sequestered with a Catholic family. They bleached his hair to make him look like a young blonde boy to change the colors. Mm. Not what he was, but what he looked like. And so we're, we're saddled with that. We're saddled with a kind of, a very almost, I guess, a survival idea that the other inevitably represents a threat to the group. The group identity has to be maintained, whether it's a genetic one 
or a social organization or what it is. So civilization has tried to modify that or to make it more tractable, more manageable. But it's often in a country like ours who had a, a, a war about it. Now, wars are not very good. You know why? They perpetuate resentment, hostility, anger on the part of the losers. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't change minds, you just dominate. Yeah, you just change the instrumentalities, but you don't change the feeling. Why did racism persist? It was an economic necessity, but it's also built on a variety of hostilities. Darkest Africa, you remember that word. When I was a kid, that was a word that was used to describe darkest Africa. Now, what's the dark for a kid? Huh. Right. Danger, unknown, the boogeyman. Yeah. But it, re it reinforces that angst, that undefinable feeling. I don't know if I've, I struggle with it. I vacillate. Are we getting better? Are we as a society improving in any way at all? <laughs> or are we still the, you know, like this, you know, the savages that we were 500 years ago? It's sometimes it's hard to know. I think there are cycles in which like fractals in nature mm -hmm. that keep growing and receding, growing and receding. That's why people have faith in the arc of history. Well, when you're in the downturn, when the arc is not going anywhere, you don't feel very optimistic. And I think, look, that has to play a role. All of this plays a role in my art, what I, how it inescapably moderates my vision and all my sensibility. I don't paint happy pictures. In fact, in the light of all the tons of still life and landscapes, golden landscapes with an horizon stretching out to God's kingdom, you know, my painting of strippers don't do well. <laughs> One of the artists that I, I interviewed, Jillian Davis, sent me a video recently. It was a presentation by Alan de Bouton. I'm probably awfully mangling it, but it was an interesting discussion about looking at art in terms of what is that person missing rather than looking at art in a linear fashion, meaning this art, this piece of art was painted in this year and therefore it has this significance. He suggests looking at things more in terms of the feeling that it evokes and what the artist maybe was intending to evoke. So that combined with another conversation that I had with somebody about artists who paint, quote unquote, pretty things versus artists who go for the nitty gritty. And that conversation was kind of like, okay, there's two ways of looking at what's happening in the world right now. And one is things are bad. And I'm, I'm looking for the beauty in it. So I'm going to paint these beautiful things. And the other camp is things are bad. <laughs> and I'm going to show them to you. Hey, look, I, I don't disparage the idea of something beautiful and attractive in a way. I mean, I'm, it may sound like I have a single kind of vision and that excludes everything else. I've been drawn to things that are what I could call at the very least pleasant or somewhere rather appealing or something I wanted to hold on to for no reason except that it was so nice. It was so, and I'm not using the word beautiful, but something that grabbed you in a way that said, oh, this is special. And I don't, I have no program. I'm not geared to, oh, here this is, your, I have to see this and this is what I'm looking for in the world. I'm a serendipitous human being. I fall into things and suddenly I say, there's something wrong with this. This is, it looks like what everybody knows and understands, but there's something wrong. And, and I have to go by that instinct. Mm -hmm. For example, I'm doing just a lot of remakes in a way of just heads of people. And I'm looking at it from the point of view, how far do I want to push that mimesis, that sense of, recognition of identification. And will it change something? Will it keep me from getting at something that I, I do almost unconsciously without thinking? Well, 
It doesn't, because refining the image to a certain extent almost reinforces the sensibility that I didn't expect would be there in the first place. I mean, I do paintings that have kind of, they confuse me. How does it happen? Mm -hmm. I really, I really don't know. I don't think that one is better than the other, or I think it's just a different conversation and a different response to the fact that we as human beings are, we're complicated, we're confusing, we contradict ourselves, we are wonderful, we are beautiful, we are strong, and, 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 you know, like all of these things. Oh, I think the range of possible expressiveness and or, if you want to call it subject matter, what people look at, and what they're interested in, is not confined to any one paradigm, that this is the only way and this is the only One of the problems, and I think it's increasingly become self-aware or self-conscious on the part of its participants, is the growth of an academic community. I'm an academic, not in a scholarly sense, but taking on the role of the, what was abandoned in the late 19th century, which is the French Academy, and the idea of a certain proper way of both drawing and rendering and accuracy and so on. Mm. And a lot of the work, while it's very appealing in its own confined way, I'm thinking of one or two people who worked on it. And that's, again, the individual who brings something else to it. But by and large, the participants become a little uniformly uninteresting. I had a very heated discussion about this <laughs> when I was in Italy. It's really, it's really interesting. But yeah, this idea of the formulation of rules in the whole atelier system, you know, which is that the French Academy and, and the lack of knowledge of, of history. I don't want to, I don't, I honestly didn't want to blame it all on that, you know, like that style of teaching. I think, I definitely think it's, a, it's a reaction to something. It's a reaction to what you alluded to earlier, you know, that representational art was shoved aside for several decades and got to the point where we were almost losing it. So I think that these, these are an attempt to bring that back. But the issue really centered around the fact that they start at a certain point in art history and sort of ignore everything that happened before that and don't respond to to it at all. It's just, this is the way that you draw the human figure. This is the way it's done. And there's not a lot of room for, I don't see a lot of room for the artist to show their emotion and come through. I meant to ask you, is that your painting behind you? Yes. Uh -huh. yes. I it it gave me a very nice feeling. <laughs> Good. <laughs> no, it looks it looks very accomplished, number one, and also very dramatic. I'm not going to get into flattering you, but because I hear you speak from an artist's sensibility, I think every time you have a kind of manifesto, I call it manifesto exhibitions. Here's what what's right, and it it seems almost authoritarian and very counter productive, but inescapably, and this is the, the broadest view of it, not just from the point of view of star, but it doesn't get out of the art school. It doesn't get out of mm -hmm. the studio. Mm -hmm. It's all located in this environment that's often cloaked in darkness because that was the effective way that the late Munich school had. And you can focus on the drama of light and dark. It's very effective. No question about it. But at the same time, and I've broached this to friends who are part of the, the Florence Academy, and I, I said there's, there's a built-in problem. There's too much fidelity to and affection for a certain look and a certain set of criteria. I was distressed when I wrote this article about Degas because I didn't want it to seem like that was determining my outlook as a style, as a look, because in fact, at some point, I loved Degas much too much, and I was doing things that were reminiscent of or had a similar subject matter. I did it as a way of challenging, like I said, you know, why is there subject matter? Why can't you paint the dancer? 
Is that off limits because somebody else did it so remarkably and too much maybe? But inescapably, it has that kind of, oh, you know, he's trying to look a little more. But I mentioned the Degas painting because it, it involved something that had to do with a larger idea, a set of understandings about how to translate the world visually and come out with something that was more than just resemblance. And I thought the little Degas had emphasized that. That was part one of a two-part conversation with Bert Silverman. Thank you so much to Bert for his time and insight. Show notes for this episode are on SavvyPainter.com. Just click on the podcast tab to see Bert's paintings and get links to any of the artists or resources that we talked about. Savvy Painter, Gamblin, Artist Colors, and Trakel Art Supplies are teaming up together to do our first online art competition. Artist Carol Marine will be jurying the show. You might remember that Carol was a guest on The Savvy Painter. She's a painter herself and the founder of DailyPaintWorks.com. First place winner will receive $500 in merchandise from both Gamblin and Trakel, plus a cash prize of $250, but that's not all. The first place winner will also be a guest on the Savvy Painter podcast. So if you win first prize, you get your work in front of tens of thousands of people, a thousand dollars worth of art supplies to paint to your heart's content and some cold hard cash. Entries are being accepted from now until October 29th, 2017. Go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the call to entries tab for more information. I can't wait to see the great work that you submit. Good luck. Lastly, I'd like to take a moment to thank some of you who support the podcast. The Savvy Painter podcast is made possible in part by listeners like you. Much gratitude to Bruce Katz, Elizabeth Quinn Bolduck, Carolyn Green, Karen O'Connell, Alchemy Works, Barbara Chantre, Christine Rasmussen, Jill Opelka, Roxanne Zuniga, Kathleen Speranza, Rebecca Bellamy, Jeanette Gray, Denise Klitsy, Patricia Matranga, Art of Joy, Gail Height, Barry Koplowitz, Winslow Art Center, Jiang Kim, Srivana Nara, and Jennifer Lessman. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.